Welcome everybody and with a new map for the Middle East, I think we should talk about uh, the new democracy imperative. Uh, I'd like always these sessions to be interactive uh, because I think you hear a lot of guests talking on TV channels and in newspapers and I think all of you should get the chance to talk to officials, ask them whatever you want to ask. So we will start with a short round of one question to each of our guests and then uh, the floor is open to you. Uh, please uh, remember that this is an open session. You'll be able to tweet and uh, interact with the people over Twitter or even Facebook as we are in this session. Uh, I've also tweeted a couple of days ago and I have some questions. Let me first of all introduce our guest, uh, Mr. Amr Musa, uh, former Secretary General for the Arab League. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, Mr. Rafiq uh, bin Abdus Salam, uh, he's the Foreign Affairs Minister for Tunisia. And uh, welcome uh, Mr. Paul Swiboda, if I pronounce well, it's good. <laughs> and he's the President of Demos Europa, Pub Public Policy Institute in Warsaw. Mr. Sinan Ulgen, and he's the former uh, Turkish diplomat, is a chairman of EDAM, it's a think tank in Istanbul and a visiting scholar in Carnegie Europe. And Mr. Ashraf Khalil, he's a writer, journalist, he's an independent writer and he just issued his book about the revolution in Egypt. Welcome everybody. We'll be mainly addressing three questions in this uh, session. We're going to be talking about how to build trust and the social contract. Uh, how, what are the fundamentals of reconciling the relationship between Islam and democracy? And the last question we'll be addressing is what are the next steps to build new institutions and governance? I think uh, two of our guests want to speak Arabic. Uh, I think three. three? No, uh, so you, I'll do English, you took Ashraf to your side. You told me to start with Arabic. <laughs> I like. أنت تمعان فيه ساعات الأمين عام أنت تمعان فيه إنه بحكي عربي فأخذ براحتك رح أبقى رح أبلش مع حضرتك الثقة بين المجتمع المدني والحكومات العربية مفقودة مش بس بمصر عبر العالم العربي هو تاريخ طويل من الفساد من تجمع الثور الثروي بإيد أقليل a dictatorial, dictatorial regime which led to complete lack of confidence. 18 days of revolution, revolution followed by parliamentary elections, presidential elections. Is this enough to rebuild the confidence between the society and the government? Amru Musa, thank you, Rima. You have used the word uh, the society and the civil society. Do you mean the civil society, Rima? I'm talking about confidence amongst uh, all uh, segments of the society, society of all uh, its ranks in terms of civil society, parties, uh, governmental institutions, political parties in general. Amr Musa, uh, we have to say that we are passing through a transitional period, and a transitional period uh, means that the uh, uh, relationships will be quite shaky. Uh, the relationship uh, will not be very stable amongst the various elements of the society, whether we're talking about the regime, the government, the society at large, uh, all elements are not uh, fully controlled in such a relationship. Uh, and uh, confidence is also shaken uh, in Egypt, and I believe that in Tunisia the same applies as well as in other Arab countries where we saw people rebelling against their regimes. There was a lack of confidence uh, between the governance and the people, the government and the civil society. Throughout dictatorships, uh, there was a deterioration of services. There was a, a lack of commitment uh, uh, and on the part of the governments, uh, which led to this uh, erosion of confidence. And I have seen this in the uh, campaigns. People uh, would uh, come up uh, and say that uh, peop, uh, that politicians uh, made promises during uh, their campaigns, but they did not fulfill them. Uh, you mean that this confidence, in spite of the elections, uh, is still lacking? Amr Musa. Rather than saying that it is not there, I can say that it is shaken. The confidence is shaken. Rima says uh, it is uh, not even there. 
Amr Musa. Uh, so in order to rebuild that confidence, uh, we need to first democracy. Democracy will give sufficient uh, space for all elements of the society to express themselves, uh, and they will not be mere uh, bystanders and onlookers, uh, uh, and implementation would not be uh, monopolized by one party or by uh, one side. Uh, there will be representatives on uh, the council, uh, on the various councils in the rural uh, municipal councils, etc. This will help uh, to build up the confidence that is shaken already. Another point uh, which is important uh, is the following. Uh, the performance, uh, performance of the new governments, uh, uh, will they continue to promise and not fulfill? Or will their performance uh, be far better? Uh, that is to say, they will uh, commit themselves and that they will implement their commitments. Uh, so we have uh, to say that it is a pledge. It's not a promise. It's a pledge. Uh, so it is, uh, it's like an acknowledgment of I hereby acknowledge to do this or that. Uh, I have to commit uh, to do this or that. Uh, it's not only a promise. This is how the government should address their people, their citizens. Uh, the performance of governments, uh, as I have said, is thus very important. Thirdly, we have to change uh, educational uh, systems. Uh, Educational curricula and systems ha have led to this uh, shaken uh, confidence. Uh, so it is not only democracy and implementation of uh, or execution of uh, promises, but we have also to include the third element, which is uh, how we can uh, deal with the achievements of the various nations in uh, the teaching of the uh, curricula which would uh, um, give a new uh, character to the relationship between the governed and the, govern, uh, the governor. Tunisia is uh, the first country that have uh, started the Arab Spring. And I was there, and I covered the stories there. Uh, I have met with uh, various uh, young people who had uh, PhD, uh, even uh, three or four PhDs uh, were while they were uh, unemployed or they did not have jobs. So who is uh, supporting uh, democracy? In order for democracy to thrive, uh, what are the main uh, elements? And what are you doing about that? In order to build on the democracy. Uh, democracy is a process. Uh, we cannot uh, move from one uh, situation to another situation and we will and uh, witness the birth of uh, democracy within 24 hours, not at all. However, we have started uh, on uh, very good and solid grounds. Uh, we are shaking uh, the foundations of uh, an old regime, uh, which is quite, uh, um, which was not democratic at all. Uh, the difference between the two regimes in Egypt and two Tunis and or Tunisia are only in the degrees of hegemony. Hegemony over all uh, uh, sectors and segments of the society that have uh, become tools for some families. It is not very easy to change a regime uh, overnight. We are in the process of doing that. We are in the process of building new uh, foundations based on political participation. What is very important is to have uh, overlapping consensus uh, in Tunisia. Uh, not a single political or social, uh, social uh, uh, movement uh, under a democracy can bear uh, the burdens of governance uh, on its own. But there are certain steps. Uh, yes, we have started to take those steps. Uh, we have started off with the holding elections. Uh, and uh, we, have hold, uh, we have done all this under a sort of uh, consensus, social consensus, which is unprecedented. We we know that a revolution leads to the shaking of an old regime. We had uh, constitutions and institutions that were not legitimate. And we had that sort of consensus that uh, allowed us uh, to adopt uh, a provisional government, an interim uh, constitutional uh, uh, council. And uh, we held the first uh, democratic uh, elections in Tunisia and in, the, and in the Arab world. Of course, many elections took place in the Arab world, but they were not uh, true elections, genuine elections. 
direct elections. And we were able to build up a multi-party constitutional party in the history of uh, Tunisia based on uh, national consensus. And this is something that cannot be underestimated. This is something to be copied not only in uh, Tunisia, but in other uh, adjacent uh, countries in the Arab world. And we have been reading in think tank uh, uh, researches that uh, there is something ex exceptional that has happened in uh, Tunisia, which means that well, democracy is possible Egypt in the Arab world. I and Tunisia as two examples because the, the, the concept of democracy across the Arab world is a very broad one, and I think we need a whole day to discuss it. In, are elections enough uh, to say we're democratic? And in, in, in Egypt, only 40% of the people voted. So you have around 60% of people who said nothing about the new president. Or is it a social pact, a new social pact? And what's the European experience when it comes to a social pact? Yes, thank you very much. It does take two uh, to tango. Democracy is a two-way uh, street, a two-way process, by means of which the government needs to open up and be as transparent as possible. But the civil society needs to be able to take up that offer needs to be able to mediate uh, between the different, uh, the different interests. I think what is fascinating uh, for me uh, in the Arab uh, revolutions is uh, the fact that we have altogether new stakeholders uh, in, in the process. So, uh, in Europe, we thought that the democracy activists uh, would, uh, would be the agents of change in the Arab world. Um, it proved to be a very different case, that different people uh, from the fruit vendor onwards were actually responsible for, for change. I think that, that means our concept of democracy provo promotion in the world uh, should also uh, in, e evolve to, to keep up uh, with this process. Um, um, I'm glad you, you, you brought up the European experience because in Europe we have a very fresh experience uh, with democracy building. My part of uh, the world uh, has had democracy for 23 years. It's very fresh. In the old days, Poland had a democracy of the nobility, where 10% uh, uh, in the 16th and 17th century, 10% of the population would vote. Uh, uh, but that was it. And, and then we had uh, authoritarianism, partition, semi-authoritarianism, communism, you know, um, the whole spectrum that we've covered over the years. And in '89, we started building democracy. Uh, it's, uh, it didn't uh, seem that uh, straightforward at the beginning. How did you do it? Um, I think three things were, were most uh, important. Uh, the first one was unleashing uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of other people uh, through deregulation. Uh, two million small and medium-sized enterprises were, were set up in Poland in the early 90s. So that's very important to give people actually an opportunity to uh, share in, to participate. Uh, in, uh, in what is happening. Um, then the institutions. I think the role of the institutions uh, from the very beginning was enormously important as a stabilizer. From institutions of democracy like public ombudsman on to banking supervision, which I think is at the moment state of the art. These are the new institutions which we built, so we, we, we were able to leapfrog and built uh, institutions which are now some of the best in the world. And that's, that's a success story. And the third aspect is media. I think media in the 90s played an enormously powerful role in providing the checks and, and, and balances which were lacking. We had 28 parties in the parliament uh, after 89. Uh, that was the, the starting point. Uh, it's not that different uh, from some of the situations in the Arab world. Uh, Mr. Sunan, um Turkey played an interesting role in the Middle East with the current events. Uh, I will exclude Syria uh, because of the proximity of the country to Turkey and limit the discussion to Tunisia and uh, to Egypt. What role can other countries play or the international community play to help democracy thrive, live, and last long? Because what applies to Europe doesn't apply to the Arab world. It's a new concept in the region. Well, I will start with a statement that would per 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 perhaps portray a sense of anti-climax, and that is humbleness. Uh, I think that when we talk about the role of the international community, especially in regard to democracy promotion in the Arab world, 
uh, we should be humble. Uh, we should be humble about what the international community can achieve, uh, and we should be humble about what the Arab world expects uh, from the international community. Uh, now, if we set the bar too high, uh, we are bound to be uh, a, uh, we, are, we are bound to arrive at a point where we would have we would not have fulfilled the full expectations. So I think that would be my first uh, caveat in terms of what the international community can achieve. Now, when we talk about in concrete terms what can be done, again, I think I will be a bit iconoclastic here. And I will uh, not use the term democracy promotion, but uh, I will certainly champion a more holistic approach to democracy promotion. What I mean by that is that the Western approach to democracy promotion uh, has been somewhat toxic. It has been toxic because of its relationship with the former regimes. Uh, we, see, we, we even see you know, the reaction within the Arab societies to this type of overt democracy promotion. It's not that long ago that the US, uh, some of the US foundations uh, were brought to trial in Egypt uh, for the work that they've been trying to do. Uh, so what I would champion really is to take a more holistic approach and prioritize a partnership for economic governance, first of all, rather than the pure, hardcore political approach. So instead of talking about how we can promote human rights, instead of talking about how we can build a better political system, which has been really the approach of the West so far, uh, I would champion a slightly different approach and really look at how the West can first help uh, to, those societies to achieve a better economic future, which I think is indispensable for consolidating democracy. Because now there are enormous expectations from the new governments, and rightly so. But those, uh, those expectations have to be fulfilled. If those expectations are not fulfilled, that is the biggest risk to democracy in well, the region. Well, and unemployment in Egypt is Absolutely. around 40%. Absolutely. So uh, you would hear people on the streets saying democracy and politics doesn't feed me at the end of the day. Exactly. So that's why in order to give more legitimacy to the transition, to democratic transitions, I think the West and the Arab world can certainly work together on a program of good economic governance. Now, there are two additional reasons why I say so. One is when you look at, and a colleague of mine did a study of the uh, electoral promises of the Islamist parties across the Arab world. The Brotherhood, uh, Nahda, uh, the PJD in Morocco. And the sense that we get from this is that there is an openness to a collaboration with the West on economics rather than on the political side. On the political side, there is certainly resistance. There is resistance because of the sense of dignity in the Arab world. There is resistance because of the former Western approach of supporting the regimes. Yes. But there is an openness to work on a joint economic agenda. And I think this is certainly an area which can be built up to work to, on a joint program for job creation, to work on a joint program of you know, catching more foreign direct investments, on regulatory capacity building, all of these concrete issues where trust can be built between the West and the Arab societies, but also going back to your initial question, trust can be built between governments and the people. And I think the secret to that trust, as the Turkish experience by and large shows, is really to achieve economic success. Yes. Uh, Ashraf, uh, I just came back from Egypt. Uh, I filmed a special edition of Inside the Middle East on education in the Arab world, and the majority of it came from Alexandria and Cairo. Okay. We stayed there for 10 days, uh, or one week, and while we were shooting, uh, what shocked me most, talking to the drivers. They are the, uh, they are the, um, they are the real voice on the street. These are the people that go on the streets every day. A uh, few comments surprised me. And these drivers don't work for the government nor the military. As A lot far of Shafiq supporters, right? <laughs> no, not this. They said it's too chaotic. Uh, it's too unorganized. We, must, we miss Mubarak days. So I just want to see or know from you, what is the time frame that the people are giving the Egyptian government for things to happen. How often and how many times are you go to Tahrir? Are you going to go to Tahrir Square? I, I think people are very impatient, and and part of it is understandable. 
but um, the 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 one of the things I remember very vividly a protest last summer in Tahrir Square. You know, after the revolution, middle of the summer, and someone was walking around with a with a sign that said "Yaskut the Reis al Qadim." <laughs> down with the next president <laughs> and we you don't know, care who that whoever <laughs> it is and whoever comes after that that it, it and and i think that is the country might be ungovernable for for the for the short term i mean people have so many expectations you know there's already a backlash against the muslim brotherhood's performance in parliament and they haven't really had a chance to do anything or not do anything but one thing i think we've discovered in the last year is that i think egyptians have a very uh, hair trigger tolerance for instability and perceptions of instability. There's this widespread perception that everything is unstable, that crime has shot up, and that is kind of driving people, that's driving this, oh, I miss the Mubarak days. And But it's, it's not a perception. It's Even partially. I, as a visitor, felt that Cairo is different now. In I a good way and in a, a bad way. A lot of it is psychological. It's, it's, there, the crime has gotten worse. Yes. Uh, but it's still much safer than any American city. And it's still, it is, you know, but people, but if you listen to the way people think, you talk, you just sound like there's people on fire walking down the middle of the street. And it's just not. It was, it, 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 it has been a little bit exaggerated. And I think the predictability of the Mubarak years kind of put us to sleep. And now we're in this situation where things are unpredictable. How much time? And, and it's How freaking much time people are you out. giving the government? I think... This government is not going to have that much time before they have to put something on the table to satisfy people. And it is, it's, it's entirely, it's not ideological. It's security and economy, pure, period. And yeah, I think, I think the Egyptian people have been patient for a long, long time, and they're done. How often do you go to Tahrir Square? I mean, I'm, I'm there two or three times a week just because Why? it's the middle of the city, and that's, I, that's my metro stop. <laughs> You know, I take the metro in from Maidi to Tahrir Square, so I'm a daily, you know, I'm, I'm commuting. But no, whenever there's, there's something going on there, I'm, I, I, I go to check it out. I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm, I can get there in 20 minutes from my house. So, uh, so, but it's part of my daily reality okay. is Tahrir Square. I'd, li I'd like to open the floor for questions. Let's make it an interactive session. Uh, I think the next question will be about the, uh, the, uh, the, the reconciliation between Islam and democracy. Mr. Amr... Uh, Yes, I wish to make a comment on uh, the interventions of the two gentlemen, uh, Mr. Ulgen and Ashraf Khalil. Uh, first, I do agree with your approach about the holistic approach to the uh, reform. The problem we are facing is not only an economic uh, crisis, but a whole crisis in the life of the society. So we need to have a holistic approach. There is no question about that. Not the holistic approach in terms of what we use, uh, the expressions that we use in international conferences, but real holistic approach that deals with education, healthcare, agriculture, the uh, human uh, development, everything. So that is what we need. Yes, indeed, West, the West can help Egypt and, of course, Syria on that uh, in particular on that account, the economic aid, and more than that. That is why in my program, and I still believe in it, I suggested that we as Egypt requests, formally requests, a virtual membership in the European community, European Union. We know we are not Europeans, we are not really seeking membership, but what we need is a virtual one. Now, how to do this? The Turks, your country, has indeed succeeded because it followed a certain code that if you want to reform the administration, we ask you to do A, B, C, and D. And then it moved from administration to the economy to social affairs in, 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 and so on, chapter after chapter. I suggested and I continue to suggest, and I'm going to tell the new, our new government uh, this, about this uh, proposal or this idea that the best thing to do is to cooperate with the European Union on the reform that would bring a country from the past and transfer it to the future. The holistic approach, the role of the West, it has to be comprehensive but through this door. 
the virtual membership in a system. Yes. And the third one is about the political side. We do not differ with, with, the, with the Europeans on, the, on democracy, for example. But we have a sad experience that they advised, they worked, they pushed that democracy is the name of the game. Demo you have to follow democracy. And when they were faced with the victor who is not to their liking, they forgot about democracy. This is not a way of dealing with things. That is why opting for democracy is a homegrown what? thing now. Can it's not things? because of the West. We need democracy. Who is the, who's the victor who's not, uh, tell not you, to the liking? Hamas, lacking. for example. When the Palestinians bought the idea Hamas. that we are going to yep. conduct free elections, and they did. Hamas won. They said, no, 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 don't, no democracy. We don't agree. But that, that's, that was a joke and a sad joke. That is why the democracy that we are longing for now is homegrown. It is our need, not their need, not their so advice. So it's not an imported democracy. Okay. I'd like to take the first question. May I uh, make a brief comment on Quickly, what Ashraf please. was saying and what you were saying about the drivers and what the drivers said? They do not mean the return to Mubarak's rule. But they were, they miss they stability, miss stability and order. But they definitely oppose oppression and repression. So you take it that way. Yeah. The drivers have told you their demand. They the need way. stability, not the return to the previous one. Uh, I'd like to take the first question, please. Go ahead. Uh, please, the mic. Oh, sorry. So we've given the mic first. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, please, yeah, give a comment, but please yeah. introduce yourself. Okay, Jamal Fakhra from Bahrain. Jamal Fakhra from Bahrain. The problem, actually, from what I understand from Amr Musa and uh, the Tunisian minister, is that there is a full conviction that democracy is uh, the solution uh, to all problems. I believe that what will happen now is the following. Uh, there will be a breaking down of the society. There will be factionism. Uh, there will be various uh, groups uh, within the society. And uh, they will not, we will not witness a true citizen, uh, citizenship uh, spirit. Why? Unfortunately, uh, we have to admit that democracy is a process. And uh, we have uh, uh, tra trans. We have seen a transfer from uh, um, certain uh, groups uh, to uh, uh, parties. The transfer of power has come to parties that do not have any experience, and they will uh, practice what uh, has been practiced against them. So do not let us not expect that uh, all our problems uh, in the Arab world will be resolved uh, through this uh, transfer to democracy. Democracy cannot be the uh, only solution. It has to be preceded by a process uh, that would lead to a change of mentality and a true understanding of uh, democracy. In the Arab world, we have various problems, such as uh, the lack uh, of freedom of expression uh, and uh, the civil rights, uh, human rights that have uh, not been uh, respected and uh, uh, even the people who have assumed uh, power nowadays do not uh, truly understand this and this means that we'll have um, a negative repercussions uh, maybe I can have a very com uh, short comment uh, Farid Yassin uh, the Iraqi ambassador in France uh, uh, we have started off with elections in Iraq, and uh, the result now is that we had uh, the third round of uh, national elections. I have to say the following, that uh, there is something very important when we talk about elections. Uh, the electoral code or law should be very carefully chosen in order to choose uh, the um, principles for representation on a careful uh, basis, or else uh, we will have uh, tribalism. And uh, this can be resolved as as I have said, uh, if uh, we have a carefully studied electoral law. Unfortunately, in Iraq, in the first round of elections that took place in uh, uh, December 2005, uh, the UN has uh, adopted for uh, an electoral uh, process or uh, code that has uh, encouraged uh, uh, tribalism. And uh, we amended that, that electoral law. So this is very important that 
uh, it is very important to take that into consideration. Uh, Mr. Abdis Abdesalam, would you like to answer? Yes, I will uh, answer to that uh, query or that comment from uh, Bahrain about uh, democracy that might bring back uh, tribalism and uh, chaosism and sectarianism. Uh, we don't have uh, magical solutions uh, in uh, the political uh, arena, or else uh, we'll be dreaming if we think that we'll have such uh, uh, magical uh, solutions. We are human beings, and we have have a certain uh, conduct uh, within a certain uh, time uh, um, frame. And we need some time for political solutions uh, to to become stable. I don't want to talk about uh, things in a dramatic manner as if we are uh, going back to the old uh, heaven uh, rather than this uh, democracy. Is this dramatic or is this uh, pragmatic when we're talking about sectarianism? It is uh, something uh, that exists in the Arab world. Yes, yes, uh, we have seen this in Iraq, in Tunisia, and in Egypt. But it is not that dramatic because revolution by nature, by nature means that we are shattering the f uh, foundations of the old system. New system. Uh, so to dismantle the old regime uh, uh, means that we'll go through a transitional uh, phase. Uh, otherwise, we will not have uh, revolution. Maybe uh, if we don't do that, we'll have a coup d'etat, but not a true uh, political revolution. A true political revolution means a shaking up of the old regime, which would uh, lead uh, to political, social, and economic uh, problems. It is not that dramatic. We have a clear uh, experience in Tunisia. Who can say that uh, under Berhani it was better than the current day, uh, situation? Even in Egypt, uh, we know that there are difficulties, difficulties that are linked to transitional period. Uh, Rima Maktabi, let us uh, go back uh, to a discussion uh, that uh, we can uh, really hold. Uh, uh, we are not uh, comparing Ben Ali and Mubarak's uh, times and uh, democracy. We're talking about whether democracy is only a matter of the uh, elections or what are uh, the concrete steps. This is the discussion. This is what I wanted to say. Democracy is a process. It's a process, no doubt. But democratic mechanisms cannot be underestimated. Let me please answer the question. Democratic mechanisms are extremely important and essential. Without these mechanisms, you can call it whatever you want. It will not be democracy. The genius of democracy is not in the philosophical claims or ideological claims. Democracy is in the pragmatic and mechanisms check and, balance powers, and the checks the separation and balances. between the state and the civil society, the freedom of expression, the independence of the judicial system. These are the foundations of democracy as a pragmatic political system. Please go ahead. Shukran, Rima. Thank you, Rima. My name is Al Munsef Sheikh Ruhu. I'm a parliamentarian in the uh, National uh, Council in Tunisia. I am deputy uh, chair of the uh, Financial Committee. I'm in the opposition. I'm in one of the opposition parties. And I would like to respond to some of the questions that were posed, going back to the role of opposition in democracy. Democracy is not about democratic elections, electing a ruler to rule as he pleases. Democracy is about electing a parliament that will select a government, but there is always an opposition that has a responsible role to play. My question is, what is the responsibility of the opposition? Opposition is not just to oppose the ruling party. Opposition has to propose as well. It's opposition and proposition. They say no, but they also give the alternative. Opposition is also not just listening to foreign agendas, like in our country, listening to what Europe has to say, or as our Turkish friend here said, Europe two years ago used to say in Tunisia, the choice is between Taliban and dictatorship. Where were we, the Democrats at the time? Europe today cannot uh, interfere or tries to interfere with some uh, opposition parties to try to break the common ground that we are trying to build in our country. What is the true role of democracy in the Arab Spring today, a uh, true role of the opposition in the Arab Spring today? This is a question that I pose to uh, Mr. Suibouda and also to uh, Mr. Uh, the Turkish uh, uh, speaker with us today. What is the importance of uh, rotation in uh, rule? in governing. 
كنت حميد تمار من الجزائر حميد تمار فروم الجزائر I think that the, I agree completely the, the, the transition period is a, a process. How long it will be, you ask question? The time. There is no answer to this question. It's historical. It could be two days, it could be two years, depending on the country, depending on the rapport de force between the stakeholders within the society. Depends on the history of the country. So it's very difficult to answer, really. It will last two years or three years or four years, and so on. The problem is to observe what are the forces within society which are taking over, indeed, and be sure that these people who are taking over are in the right direction when it comes really to democracy. The uh, answer of uh, Sia Amar Musa, when he said, the problem is should be holistic. Holistic in the sense which is defined by uh, Sia Amar Musa. Because defined in terms only of developing, uh, development, good governance, economic governance, is not enough. It's certainly not enough. The previous regime tried to, did that, to, to do that, I mean, to develop the country. But the problem is, indeed was the organization, the, the, how the things were uh, 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 undertaken, how the dialogue was that, going that was with the other parties. And that's the reason why I think yes. it's more than simply uh, advising to, vo to go for development. Turkish, Tur Turkey went for development, succeeded because they did both. They did democracy and they did development at the same time. They went for Europe, but at the same time they were transforming their whole, their whole system. That's the reason why the problem is really a rupture, a rupture complete, a complete cut with the, the past, and it can be, it should be do, done quickly, very quickly, as quickly yes. as possible. Finally, the, the question which is, which, which, would be, which, which our uh, Jordanian uh, colleague was saying that probably we have to teach people there is a, a learning before democracy, that's a nonsense. Because the learning process is with democracy. It's when you start democracy, indeed, that the learning process will start at the same time. There is no such thing as to wait that people will be ready for democracy to go for democracy. That doesn't work. Yes. We have to jump, and when we are in democracy, because democracy is not elections. Democracy are holistic. It means really the whole society should move and given the right to talk, to exchange, to have freedom and do set up. If we don't have that sort of holistic approach, I mean, thank you, Mr. Abdul Hamid. I'll pass the question to Mr. Paul coming from Mr. Munsef, and then we'll hear Mr. Sunan. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just make one, one plea, really, as, because as I listened to, uh, to the discussion about chaos, about the risks ahead, um, one thing comes to my mind, you know, cherish the, the symbolism of, of the Tahrir Square. Cherish the symbolism of, of what happened. That's really the most important and invaluable thing that you've got. Uh, the know-how you can, you can bring from, from other places. So it will take years, it will be difficult. So. But the most important thing you have is this immense, incredible narrative that was, that was yes. created. And if you, if you look at Eastern Europe, if you look at a country like, like Ukraine that wasted its chance with the Orange Revolution, and now it's gone. You know, nobody is going to, to listen any longer to any opposition figures who, who, who think that uh, that experience uh, could have a rerun. It's over. So once uh, you create uh, a gray zone and you make too many compromises, you waste that opportunity. Opposition is, is extremely important uh, in building the mainstream uh, consensus and addressing the real issues. And I think that's uh, an advice to both the governments and the opposition from our experience. Focus on the real issues. Don't create additional problems. You will have enough uh, problems uh, uh, of, of your own. And it will take uh, years. It will, it will be difficult. Uh, in, in 95, six years after the Polish transition started, I remember one of our top columnists writing uh, in January of that year, predicting what's going to happen during the year, uh, that we will either go through the needle's eye to the west, or we will get stuck in the mud of Pinsk, Pinsk being a town in, in Belarus in the, to the east of the country. That tells you a lot about the existential... Uh, uncertainty, which we still felt six years which after the transformation started, extent. which is justified because of the immense yes. scale of the transition. Uh, Mr. Sinan, 
Uh, yes. There were some questions and uh, criticism probably or points raised if you would yes. like to answer. Indeed, thank you. First, I want to react to uh, Mr. Musa. Um, I wish the EU had far-sighted leaders uh, as you, because when you bring aboard a concept like a virtual membership, uh, that's a very appealing idea, but I don't think that the EU today has the intellectual capacity to respond to that, and that's from a pro-EU person. Uh, secondly, uh, on the uh, role of the opposition, um, Many people actually define the quality of democracy by the quality of its opposition, not by the quality of, this, of its government. So I think it's really a fundamental question. Uh, it's really the question that divides whether the democracy that we are going to build, or that you are going to build, is going to be a liberal democracy or an illiberal democracy. And I think the jury is still out on that. I think Tunisia has really done a very, you know, uh, a very instrumental clear step towards building a consensus-driven liberal democracy. Because it is only in that type of society, driven by consensus and not by majoritarianism, which is also a risk for my country, by the way, uh, not driven by majoritarianism, but driven by consensus, believing in the checks and balances, believing in dissent, and therefore believing in the role of opposition. So if you have a leadership that does not believe in checks and balances, that derides the opposition, then what you're going to end up with is perhaps a democracy, but a shallow democracy, an illiberal democracy. Uh, just a quick question here, since you're talking about checks and balances. Is the image of Hosni Mubarak being tried enough to make the Egyptians believe in the judicial system in Egypt no. and think Clearly that, not. as of now, all politicians will be tried, will be held uh, accountable to what they're doing? Clearly no, because the risk, uh, and I, that's why I gave the example of Tunisia, which to me is a very good example of a consensus-driven democracy. The risk in Egypt is majoritarianism. So the risk, therefore, is for one political Party. movement to basically capture all the state institutions. Uh, and that is why, again, we come back to the role of, democ of the opposition which is why I think it's very important to try to think thoroughly and intelligently from the outset about what sort of checks and balances can be established that can sustain the okay. threat of majoritarianism. I'd like to move to Islam and democracy because all our discussion is taking us to Akhwan Muslimin in Egypt and the Islamist parties and taking over. But just one, uh, uh, one word from Ashraf. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up very, very quickly on, on some of the points that have been made in that this, this, this idea of a holistic revolution in Egypt. I just think what I'm seeing in Egypt, and I'm, I'm curious about uh, to, to come to Tunis and see how it's gone, in that I think one of the biggest problems that's happening in Egypt is I don't see an acknowledgement from my fellow Egyptians that we were all part of the problem, that we need to fix ourselves and we need to fix our interactions with each other. And, you know, the failure to just treat this society with a sense of ownership, uh, something as mundane as just the rampant littering that takes place in Cairo. These, this is big. This is indicative of something. And um, you, so th th there, is, there is this perception that the problem was all at the top. And so we've, we've changed the names at the top, and now we're done. And it's not that way. We were all part of the problem all through. The corruption spread all through. The nepotism spread all through. The nepotism which squanders so much talent in Egypt and drives some of the best people out of the country. That wasn't Mubarak didn't do that personally. We all did that to ourselves. And, and I don't think we're anywhere near acknowledging that as a society. Yes. Uh, I'd like to move to the relationship between Islam and democracy. Uh, you hear a lot of stereotypes in the streets among people that, oh, very soon all women have or must be veiled. Uh, women's rights will be in jeopardy because the Muslim Brotherhood are taking over. I'm going to move on. So there's this fear. Of اليوم الحكم الإسلامي رح يتسح المنطقة وبالتالي الأقليات المسيحية الشيعية الأقليات الإثنية المرأة حقوق الإنسان في مهب الريح ماذا تقول بهذا الموضوع؟ أولاً Let me answer in English 
first of all, okay. the issue is irreceivable. As a question, irreceivable. The relationship between democracy and Islam, and as if Islam cannot produce or deal with or coexist with democracy. This is a wrong perception. And the, 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 the repetition of such... Why wrong? Why wrong? There because are examples around the Arab no, world. No, no. Because there is this experience in Turkey, for example. It's the they only democracy. example. No, no, it's not the only. This, this is an experience, and it could be repeated. And not only in Turkey. Egypt was exactly in the same position as Turkey in the full half 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. Democracy and elections, rotation, constitution, the supremacy of law, all that was in Egypt before we started the era of coup d'etat, etc., etc. So it's, the question is not between Islam and democracy, but between democracy and dictatorship. Islam should bring us back to the basic tenets of that great religion as the principles, as a philosophy, as a religion to pray with, etc. But it cannot oppose, and there is nothing in the Muslim literature, being the Quran or any other document, that opposes the freedom of people Ma to select or to or to human rights, Islam fundamental Islam freedoms, etc. The so problem is not it's, uh, Islam itself. It's the interpretation of Islam. Okay. And then, we cannot deny then the, the fact. the question is wrong. The issue is put wrong. I, I'm not, wrongly. I'm not, uh, yeah. I'm not sticking to the question here. The, the, the thing is, when we see Salafists across the Arab world uh, or extreme hardliners, what image are you giving to the okay. rest of the people? I will answer by saying, what about the neoconservatives in America that are saying everything wrong about Christianity, Islam, and, and in fact humiliating other philosophies? So there are those extreme people, those, these are those, uh, what you call, uh, extremists. So not only in Islam, but in the, the experience with the neoconservatives in America is the saddest experience in the recent years. They have killed or trying to kill the rights of the Palestinians and any right that we in the Middle East or in the Arab world have. Yes. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Rafi, the, the, the problem is because of these long dictatorships, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood were the only, or the Islamist parties, were the only parties that were well organized, there, ready, and when the chance happened, they just took it. Um, it there's a fear of the one party rule again. To what extent are you working on, it's not only the Islamist parties taking over, there are the minorities, there is the opposition, there are, there's the civil society and the youth, what are you yeah. doing? <clears throat> Let me first uh, go back to the previous question related to Islam and democracy because it's very interesting, you know, to answer, you know, such, you know, problematic. Uh, I think Islam and democracy are contingent subjects. Islam, like any other great religion, is subject to different interpretations. Uh, this is what precisely you said. All depends about interpretation. Is it good interpretation of Islam or bad interpretation of Islam? Uh, personally, I strongly believe the only way to compete or defeat bad interpretation of, of Islam by good interpretations, um, open, tolerant interpretations of Islam. Islam always is subject of varieties, different strategies of interpretations. Of course, there are rigid, um, extremist view interpretations of Islam vis-a-vis -vis other, you know, forms and other strategies of interpretations. Democracy also is a contingent uh, process. The main thing in democracy is the procedure of democracy itself, check and balance its power, the separations of powers, whatever you know, the philosophical or ideological claims of democracy. And this is what makes democracy valid, has a universal uh, validity. It works within a Christian legitimacy, either in a Protestant legitimacy or Catholics, and then within other cultures and religions. And it is possible to work within an Islamic context. We already see this, you know, such experience in Turkey as well. There is great possibility to, to have such you know, reconciliation on yes. the ground between Islam and democracy I, in the Arab world. Across, Related to I the across, political Islam, yeah. just to be very brief, I strongly believe that what is called political Islam or Islamists are political actors, are not metaphysical creatures. They are deeply affected by the socio-political 
environment in which they are functioning. Good uh, and healthy political environment could give you a good Islamist. A close dictatorship could you provide or produce a bad, you know, Islamist like Al-Qaeda and other extremist uh, voices of Islam. I'd like to take more questions. Uh, please, can you <coughs> pass the mic? I have the mic. Ah, yeah, please. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Lebanese. I live in Egypt. My question is to Mr. Amr Musa. What is it that most surprised you in the elections in Egypt, the Egyptian elections? Were you surprised by what happened? And what was it that the most question is, if you were surprised to do it you? All over again, what would you do differently? Um, there have been some discussions about vote splitting. Maybe the liberal parties or liberal bodies or people seem to be more liberal. Uh, could have uh, formed a coalition in order to prevent vote splitting. So what's, what is your comment on both questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me come back for a minute for this Islam and uh, democracy. <laughs> I, I believe Islam is democratic. The <laughs> just said, and, no, you raised an important point about minorities. No. Dealings with minorities. There's real fear. Now, yes, indeed, it has nothing to do with real Islam, but with the people that are claiming to implement such thing. This has to do with bad management, with bad culture, yes. with lack of proper education. Minorities, they have nothing to do. The Islam has full respect of that, but it is those political Islamists that are really confusing the issue. It's politicizing totally. Islam. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That is the Please, answer. can we answer? Now, about the, the uh, coalition of liberals in Egypt. It will come. Liberals were divided, and divided because of uh, special interests, uh, the uh, lack of maturity. In fact, the Tunisians have dealt with the problem, which is almost the same, with more mature reactions than we did in Egypt. So we, I, I agree with, uh, with Rafiq with what he said. And Egypt needs to reorganize its political society. The liberals until this moment have not yet come together to say, here is the, we are the liberals, this is the front, and we have to do that. Yes. And I'm one of those who will try to do exactly what you are asking for. Um, the time is, is, is of essence here. Yeah. Because we're talking about minorities, I'd like to hear Al Ab uh, Nabil. Uh, uh, thank you, Rima. Uh, I am uh, Father Nabil Haddad from Jordan. I'm very Arab, very Christian, and very Catholic. Maybe I did not pray enough for my friend uh, Amr Musa to, uh, to win. All he got is three, three million. So but next time. I agree, it's your ne fault. Next time, yes. <laughs> Uh, when we talk about minorities, uh, I, I, I would like to clarify uh, my own uh, 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 the position of of most of the Arab Christians. Uh, Arab Christians had n never had a problem living with uh, with Muslims when when the Muslims were the moderate, and uh, I see around the Arab world many of them. Uh, but unfortunately, these days, what we see is uh, uh, the neo. Uh, uh, Muslims, the neo-Islamists, if we want to go by, by the new terminology of the neo-Christians. What, what do you see, gentlemen, the future of the Arab Christians and how would you assure them of their presence if you see in the House of Democracy in Cairo the democracy that brought Salafists to the House of Democracy where 15 million Copts were not recognized when one minute of silence was not accepted by the Salafists. While we see 1400 years of amicable uh, coexistence between Muslims and Christians. I come from Jordan where I believe that Jordan is a model for, for coexistence between Muslims and Christians. Uh, where are the good Muslims and where are the good Christians yes. in this case? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to take more questions before taking answers. Please to go ahead. Thank you. Um, name is Emre Darman from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, two of our panelists have made a very passionate argument that Islam is in fact compatible with, with democracy. 
Uh, let me tweak the question a little bit. If we're not talking about uh, Islam, if we're talking about religious, uh, religious ideology, is the argument still as passionate? In other words, does anyone on the panel believe that um, as religious ideologies take prominence in the concept of a political party, whether that be a majority party or the opposition, there is a step away from democracy simply because of the dogmas associated with any religion. Thank you. Please, can you pass the mic to Jamal Khashoggi? Uh, Jamal Khashoggi, I have a question to Mr. Amr Musa. I'm a Saudi journalist, yes. We hear people in Egypt calling for ideas and ideologies that are undemocratic. Uh, so, for example, cancelling the elections, a presidential council, and the candidate, Ahmad Shafiq, is also making calls against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. It's causing polarization within the uh, Egyptian society, which means uh, that it will be difficult for him if he wins the elections to work with a parliament with a majority of uh, Muslim Brotherhood candidates. What do you think of these issues, uh, cancelling the elections uh, and these other points? Back to the questions, please go ahead. The three points that you raised now, cancelling the elections, I'm against that. I'm totally against that because, and many people, I think the majority in Egypt, despite the ambiguity that people feel currently in uh, choosing between uh, two choices that are both bitter choices, but we cannot annul the elections. If we do that, it will be going back to square one. Do you think this is possible, Asrima? Yes, some people are talking about this, but I don't believe that this is a decision that will be taken because the elections have already started. The re-election has started with the uh, expatriates. I think yesterday was the last day. So we've already started the re-election process, the second round. As for presidential council, I believe that Yes, some candidates uh, are asking for a presidential council. They lost the elections, but they want a post. They want a post in a presidential council to get a position that they did not get uh, legitimately through the ballot box. I will not accept this. You're either elected or not elected. This is democracy, in my opinion. As for the uh, mobilization on uh, the part of certain groups, well, yes, because there is high tension. And the differences between uh, the candidates were minor in a few digits. And many of them are tense, especially the main two candidates in the second round. But we hope that we will not uh, have any confrontations. Sinan? There is one key word that hasn't been uh, expressed here when we talked about Islam and democracy, and that's secularism. Because what this country has proven is not secularism, laicity. What this country has proven is not that Islam and democracy is compatible. What it has proven is that Islam, democracy, and secularism is compatible. Now, as a Turk, when I look at you know, what is happening in the Arab world, what you need to prove is something that we haven't. You need to prove that Islam and democracy is compatible. Because we don't hear about the debate on secularism. We don't hear in Egypt. We don't hear in Tunisia. So what you need to prove is exactly that, that in a context where you don't have secularism, unlike Turkey, that Islam and democracy can, can work together. And there, I think we need to uh, replace secularism by pluralism. That's going to be the core concept around which Arab democracies will be built. How do you protect pluralism? In, in this context, which is key to the protection of minorities, all sorts of minorities, not only ethnic minorities, religious minorities, but also lifestyle minorities. And therefore, it really boils down to how do you build the institutional infrastructure that will be necessary to protect that pluralism, that will be strong enough to withstand in the future, today and in the future, attacks against state capture so that you don't, you don't end up in a illiberal setting, in a majoritarian setting. That's what I wanted to highlight. 
Uh, if we can just take a comment on the European experience when it comes to this, to, you, to pluralism. And uh, what's interesting, he, men he mentioned social uh, pluralism, uh, not only uh, the religious one or other uh, facts, like people want to be Islamists, they pray probably five times a day, but they're not veiled, their women are not veiled, and women are left to be as they want to be, not forced on them. I would have uh, more trust in democracy dealing with uh, the politicization of any uh, religion, because um, the experience shows that if you invest in a, in a democracy, then people at the end of the day will not uh, put the trust in, in parties who, who abuse uh, the links to, uh, to religion. Um, you need safety nets, uh, that, that for sure. Uh, in safety nets in the Constitution, in a certain set of rules, uh, and also institution in safety nets such as uh, the institution of an ombudsman. Maybe in, uh, in Egypt, in Tunisia, one would need uh, that type of new institution that would adjudicate between the different minorities and institutions to which uh, one could uh, refer if one's interests yes. are, are, are encroached upon. Yes. I, I, I haven't seen any answer to the question that the father uh, posed and actually myself coming from a minority in the Arab world, uh, I hear a lot of comments, fears, especially when you talk to Christian Syrians, right. when you talk to Egyptian, Egyptian uh, Christians, uh, Christians yeah. Uh, when you talk to Shiites, um, uh, <coughs> Alawites, mm -hmm. what is the Arab world, what are Arab leaders doing to calm down minorities with all that's happening in the region? I believe we have to reach this uh, stage of unity in diversity and uh, that the society will be more powerful with the diverse groups that form our, our society. Unfortunately, in the recent uh, uh, years, uh, in particular after the invasion of Iraq, the uh, sects and sectarian conflict uh, became uh, very, uh, or came back to the uh, central stage. Uh, this is one of our major problems in the Arab world, major problems that we have to deal with. The, uh, the sectarian strifes and the, this competition between sects and, and uh, yes, indeed, I, I recognize what uh, Father Nabil has just said, Nabil Haddad has just said, indeed, there is uh, a serious problem uh, we have, but with this awakening of our societies, the new revolution that change will have to deal with that issue as an issue of priority. And we hope that forces, the negative forces within and without the Arab world will not play havoc with this issue. Yes. Please, I would like, I would like to take more questions. Go ahead. Um, my name is Osama. I'm the Freedom and Justice Party from Egypt. And uh, I will talk in Arabic anyway. Allow me to make a very quick uh, comment uh, on the uh, minorities. I would like to bring to your mind uh, the following. What have the previous regimes uh, done vis-a-vis -vis all these issues? Uh, they had control, but they have not uh, made any real uh, or concrete achievements uh, when it comes to minorities. And uh, even in Egypt, uh, this was uh, an issue that has always been uh, brought to the forefront, uh, such as uh, the latest uh, event against uh, the uh, church. And the media has uh, played uh, its uh, role, even in uh, the terminology that we have uh, hearing uh, on uh, TV channels. We ha you have to choose between a civil, uh, civilian uh, representative uh, and a religious representative. While they mean uh, military and civilian, but not uh, religious and civilian. There is no uh, religious uh, rule or uh, government in Egypt. Uh, Sinan talked about uh, compatibility between uh, uh, democracy and uh, secularism and uh, 
uh, pluralism. Uh, there is uh, no contradiction between uh, Islam and democratic, democratic principles. Uh, we know this uh, for a long time now, but we have uh, to remember that uh, the previous uh, regimes uh, have also suffered of this issue. And uh, we have seen uh, sometimes some examples uh, of uh, lack of good existence, uh, but uh, there have always been a good uh, coexistence between uh, the Christians or the uh, minorities uh, and uh, the Muslims. Uh, we have three types of uh, countries, uh, countries uh, with uh, no constitution, countries with half constitutions, countries uh, with constitutions that do not work. And this applies to women's rights, uh, mobility, and even uh, parliamentarians uh, And uh, in Egypt. Uh, the parliament in Egypt has no capacity to uh, Thank you, Alan. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running out Thank of time. You one uh, last question, your, your please. And then I'd like the participants to give me one or two steps towards building new institutions and good governance, if you think about things you would do meanwhile. I have a very quick comment and a quick uh, comment to Father Nabil about the Salafist uh, in Egypt and uh, elections. I think that uh, in the presidential elections, uh, we have seen uh, up to what extent uh, Islam, political Islam uh, has been punished because they only uh, rallied 40% of the votes. And this uh, shows uh, that uh, the coexistence that we had for 1,400 uh, 1, years have uh, won the, uh, the day. And uh, we know that uh, a country, uh, a big democracy uh, such as the U USA has uh, elected and voted in uh, Bush uh, twice. Uh, imagine that. So Egypt uh, hopefully will have a better future. Uh, we have talked, you have talked, sir, about uh, the liberal uh, um, coalition. Do you consider Shafi as part of the liberals? Uh, you expect that Amr Musa will be embarrassed by such a question, will be cornered? Not at all. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, are you trying to uh, promote a new uh, party? What is the next step? Of course, I'm thinking of all these uh, options. Uh, maybe we can uh, have not only a party, but a front, uh, as uh, the lady from Lebanon has said, a front of uh, all uh, the liberal parties and liberal uh, assemblies. Of course, this uh, relies uh, uh, on uh, the results of uh, the elections. Uh, since you have given me the floor, let me uh, comment on what uh, Olgen has said uh, from Turkey. Uh, majoritarianism. Majoritarianism. Majoritism has been used. He mentioned this measure and he was against that and in favor of consensus. The consensus needs a different uh, background for the people and readiness and maturity. Culture. Uh, yeah, okay, you can say so also, culture. Uh, and democracy uh, is, is based on majority rule and opposition, as has been said. Opposition and the majority rule. But, uh, but not to uh, put away uh, minorities. No, there is no minorities. This is our society is responsible for whatever happens to the minority. We are responsible. We cannot put that on a foreign intervention. Or that. No, we are responsible. We have to correct that. This has nothing to do with Islam. We as a society, Muslims and Christians and others, we are responsible for that. Yes. But the point about majoritism, I believe we have to take it up. This is a serious point that needs further discussion. Perhaps you can uh, promote the need for a panel for majoritism as opposed to consensus. OK, I'll take one uh, intervention from each one of you. One question, one step. I'll start with you, Ashraf, that you would do it if, you, if we give you the mandate in Egypt. And we ask you, what's the first institution you would like to build in Egypt that helps democracy and good governance? What's the first institution, first step you would okay, take? Okay, I'll, I'll, my, my answer is, is, is going to be slightly counterintuitive. I'm, I'm going to name the institution that I would get rid of in order to help democracy in Egypt. And I, I am of the opinion, I, 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 don't, I don't, in a functioning society, I don't think there should be a Ministry of Information. I think they do more harm than good. 
I, especially in Egypt. I mean, you can talk to me about creations like the BBC, and that's, you know, that's a unique situation. Obviously, J Jazeera is government-owned, but they, they do decent work. I think the Ministry of Information has been a force for evil. I in can't Egypt. tell you the minders that come with us when we're shooting in Egypt uh, yes, every and, time. Yes, and the bottom line is they are trusted by a lot of the country. There is huge chunks of Egypt that get all their information from state television and Al Ahram. And I, I just want to see it go away. So you'd start with the media. I would appoint, if I had, if I, if I had the power, I would, I would take Mohammed al Baradai or someone of that stature and give him the job of being Egypt's last minister of information. Give him two years to tear it down. <laughs> Interesting. Mr. Sanan, what are the steps for the Arab world or for the Middle East? Two. First two steps or one two step. Two steps. Yeah. But before that, very quickly, just to react to what uh, Mr. Musa said on majoritarianism. I have a better word for it. It's called the fetishism of the national will. The belief, <laughs> the belief that if you get 50% plus one, You're you on can do own. everything. Exactly including oppressing the minorities. So that's why against, I'm against my majoritarianism. Uh, in terms of the steps, uh, two steps, one, to build, whatever the political cost may be, a competent and independent judiciary. Because if you have such a judiciary, that will give, at the end of the day, belief in the people that they have somewhere to go domestically, an institution that will fundamentally protect their rights, no matter what happens at the level of the executive, no matter how bloody, quote unquote, the political discussions and the debates are. And the second one is the press, a vibrant press, so that we will know what's, go what's happening in the society. Uh, a press that, can, that, that becomes inquisitive, a press that can report freely. This inclusiveness uh, comes uh, as a close second, because that's as I mentioned, the very spirit of the exercise, the very spirit of what has happened. So building platforms for social consultation on the key issues, uh, I think will be uh, tremendously uh, important. Let me just make one word about Europe, which was, uh, which was mentioned. I was, I was glad that Mr. Musa mentioned uh, uh, the knocking on the door of the European Union because it shows that Europe still preserves uh, its attractiveness in, in spite of uh, all, uh, all odds. Uh, and I think that's the right way to proceed because one needs to be demandeered towards uh, the European Union. That's our experience from the accession period. So I think the European partners were sick and tired of uh, the Poles, the Czechs and the Slovaks uh, knocking on the door. Uh, one needs to have a pretty clear list of what, what you need, what you want from, uh, from Europe. That's the, that's the way it works. Uh, but for Europe, this could be uh, a formative experience, to be, uh, to be honest, in the current uh, situation. Whether a membership uh, application is a good idea, I have my doubts. Uh, remember the Moroccan membership application in the 80s? Uh, the Europeans were flabbergasted when it arrived. Virtual. Virtual. I know, I know. But uh, yes. you know, at, at the time, the agreement was made that uh, uh, the Moroccans didn't send it and the Europeans didn't respond in order not to uh, put it uh, in straightforward uh, terms. But one needs to be demandeered towards uh, Europe and, and there will be a response because Europe needs uh, uh, to be active in the neighborhood just as much as the neighborhood needs Europe. Mr. Fari, what are the steps? Here that maybe virtual you know, apply means uh, virtual uh, asking you know, to be a member of the European means virtual reply from the European Union and wait for a virtual reply. Um, I think the first step is to, to build or restore a new social and political contract between political actors and between the ruled and the rulers. Because in the Arab world, we suffered for a long time ago a certain you know, uproots and alienation of the political institutions. If you look at the case of Mubarak and Ben Ali, it is a kind of apartheid system, maybe the only separation that we have into black and whites, but we have a tiny political elite who, pro who controls and monopolize the political and the social system. And I think uh, in building in this, the first priority is to set up a new social and political contract between the institutions of the state and the society. Because the state is becoming an uprooted institution, a heavy machine of oppression of dictatorship. And that's why I'm saying here, it's time to build a social bridge between the state and the society. Alienation between rulers and the, and the, and the, and the, and the ruled means, you know, no possibility to build a real and solid democracy. 
since democracy means a consensus between different you know, political players. There is no such possibility to have a solid and strong d democracy within a context of ideological or political polarization. And we already see it in European cases. If you see at Ukraine nowadays, when you have such polarization in uh, strategy of politics about internal as well as foreign policy, uh, policies, you haven't such possibility to build a real and solid democracy. That's why the first step is to yes. have to restore a social and political contract. Last word. I'll have a lighter comment, uh, since this is the last word. I noticed that you told Ashraf, if we appoint you as president, you should say, if we elect you as president. Now we are talking about democracy. Too late. It's, no appointment. it's out of the question for him <laughs> okay. to be elected. Oh, yeah, of course. And, uh, this, <laughs> Probably the second, it's the dominant culture of appointing. <laughs> the second, uh, I won't call it mistake, but observation about this came from Ashraf. You ask him, what would you do? So he answered by, I want to do away with. So in fact, we want to build. We want to build. And this is the spirit that we have to express. This is very important. Do away with the Ministry of Information. That was OK. Yes, it has to be done. But this is not the main issue. The, we start with the Constitution and so many other things that we have to build in our country and within the Arab world in general. The third observation is about what you, Mr. Svoboda, has just said, functioning democracy. The word functioning is very important because we had the form of democracy, and we can have it again. Elections, and we can have it, but it has to be functioning. So one of the words that I would add, with your permission, to my vocabulary from now on is functioning democracy, functioning actions, functioning policy, and this is what we need to not only to plan, but to have it functional and to implement it. This is what we need in the Arab world. And don't be afraid about the minorities in the Arab world. After all, you are not a minority. Uh, we have so beauty many beautiful girls in uh, the Arab world. <laughs> and I don't think beauty is what defines me. Uh, a friend, uh, when I was talking to him about this session, he said, emotional uh, democracy versus constitutional democracy. i leave you with these two words. Has it been an emotional democracy or constitutional democracy so far? And thank you all for attending. Thank you.